Ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum and good morning. I warmly welcome you all to SVI's book launch ceremony on the topic of problems and prospects of the non-proliferation regime, Pakistani perspective. It is requested that please kindly assemble and be seated so that we can begin on time. Thank you. First of all, I request from all the participants to kindly adhere to the safety guidelines as stricter adherence to the SOPs is now needed more than ever before to contain the spread of the virus. Therefore, it is requested from all of you that please wear a face mask properly inside the auditorium and please keep wearing the mask throughout the duration of the event. Ensure six feet social distancing in all the areas. The seats have been marked accordingly for your convenience. Avoid handshakes and hugs with each other. Inside the hall, please respect the designated seating to ensure physical distancing. It is also requested that please avoid standing and sitting in close grouping throughout the event. For your convenience, face masks and hand sanitizers are provided. We will be grateful for your cooperation in this regard. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, today I am grateful you all have graced the occasion with your presence in the midst of the pandemic. Now let's formally begin with the proceeding of the na with the national anthem. It is requested from all the audience to kindly rise in respect of the national anthem. Thank you.
for the inaugural session, I would like to mention here that the views and the opinions expressed in this event are those of the speakers and do not reflect the views of the SVI. It is an open house event and will be reported in print and electronic media. The event will also be live streamed on the SVI Facebook page. And the complete recording of the event will be available on the SVI YouTube channel. It is also requested that if any participant posts a picture of the SVI event on their social media page or website, can we mention in credit that the event was organized by the SVI. It is also requested that please switch off your mobile phones or kindly put them on mute. Today we are all here for the SVI book launch titled Problems and Prospects of the Non-Proliferation Regime Pakistani Perspective. This edited volume by Dr. Zafar Iqbal Chima presents coherent, consolidated, in-depth research work on the issues pertaining to the nuclear non-proliferation, arms control, nuclear safety and security, which predominantly reflects a Pakistani standpoint. So today, at this auspicious day for the Strategic Vision Institute, we would like to extend our profound gratitude to our authors, editor, reviewer, for their invaluable contributions. The author of this publication range from distinguished subject experts to note for the bureaucrats and established mid-career professionals. SVI is, hopefully, is hopeful that this book offers something valuable to share. However, I would like here to mention that the views expressed by the authors in their respective chapters do not necessarily reflect the views of the editor or the SVI. Last but not the least, today we are also delighted to collaborate with Air University in organizing today's book launch event. Ladies and gentlemen, now I will introduce you to our worthy panelists for the inaugural session. Today, on the stage, we have the President, Executive Director, Dr. Zafar Iqbal Chima. Ladies and gentlemen, our chief guest today is the Lieutenant General Mazur Jamil Hirani in Tiaz Military. We are also joined by, by the Air Marshal, VC Air University Air Marshal Javed Ahmed Hilali in Tiaz Military. Now, I would like to request Dr. Zafar Iqbal Chima to come to Rostrum and deliver his welcome and introductory remarks as the editor of the book. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Honorable Chief Guest, Lieutenant General, Retired Mother Jameel, Advisor Development National Command Authority, and the former DDSPD, Javad Mini. Air Marshal Javed Amar, Vice Chancellor of the Air University. Excellencies, Distinguished Guest, uh, dear colleagues and friends, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, it's a matter of great privilege for me to welcome the chief guest and all of you in this occasion of the book inauguration of the Strategic Vienna Institute, the problem and prospects of nuclear non-proliferation. Uh, challenges and prospects. Pakistani, the Pakistani perspective. Needless to say that there have been many individual efforts in terms of contributing articles, book chapters, and books by the individual authors on Pakistan's perspective on the various dimensions of the nuclear non-proliferation regime. But there has not been a collective compendium of all the perspectives put together at one place. And that's why the endeavor of the SVA has materialized today, that we have been put together the entire perspective ranging from the NPT, FMCT, CTBT, and other associated elements of the non-proliferation regime. Uh, this book has come a little late than we expected. Uh, it has taken almost nearly, I think, five plus years. Normally a book should come out in three years or three to four years. 
the reason for this, as I very frankly share with you, is that there have been more than one stakeholders in the production of the book. And in order to agree to a manuscript by the one holder, one stakeholder was not possible, was not compatible with the academic independence and autonomy of the contributors and the authors. So that is the reason for delaying the extra delaying of this book on this very particular subject. This book has gone in the hands of very eminent uh, discussants and copy editors, uh, beginning from Dr. Zafar Iqbal, who is not here today. He is the executive director of the BTNN, Rojasan Think Tank Network in Quetta. It has twice been edited by him. It has gone into the hands of Dr. Tudrul Yamin, who has uh, copy edited the perspective written by the young scholars who belong to the SVI. And eventually it has also been uh, copy edited by Dr. Rabi Akhtar, the director of the uh, Center for Strategy, Policy and Program at the Lahore University of, University of Lahore. I'm grateful to all the three uh, copy editors that who have contributed in improving the manuscript of, of the book. Uh, why we thought, why we thought that we should produce this work? As I said once earlier, that there has not been a single companion of the all Pakistani perspective on the non-proliferation regime and its associated elements. The second important thing is that Pakistan have been a long time participants in the non-proliferation regime and its associated elements. It has been a member of the United Nations Disarmament Commission. It is a member of 18 Nations Disarmament Committee. It is a member of the CD and it has a member of the IAEA Charter. And despite that, relatively compared with other nuclear weapon states, the Pakistani contribution of literature on the subject is relatively much smaller as compared with other nuclear weapon states. And particularly is smaller compared with our arch neighbor, India. So we thought we should produce such a compendium of uh, volume, we should compensate that kind of a, a little literature that we have on, on the subject. We have seen in the last couple of years that there have been decline or stagnation in the non-proliferation regime and its associated elements. You might have seen the NPT which is a great success of the non-proliferation regime and is a very largely signed agreement that since 2015 there has, no been, there has not been a common joint statement by the members of the NPT in 2015 and the next meeting was supposed to be held in 2020, which has not been held because of the COVID-19, and so far it has not been held. The possibilities are that because of the reasons for which the joint statement could not be issued in 2015, it is still valid. And I do not expect that there will be a joint statement in 21 or whenever the next meeting of the non-proliferation treaty is held. There generally has been decline in the international arms control and disarmament between the two great powers, the United States of America and Russia, particularly the abrogation of the ABM treaty, the abrogation of the INF treaty, and non-signing of the New START treaty between the two superpowers. There has also been a discussion that China be brought into the arms control negotiation along with the other great powers, for which China is absolutely unwilling and not willing to join those negotiations. So the, the, the climate for non-proliferation, I would like to mention before I go forward, the development of nuclear weapons by North Korea, the uncertainty prevailing Iran, on the development of nuclear weapons. The aspirants, the new aspirants in the Middle East, in the Europe, and 
and Asia, East Asia. So that makes the, the, the status of the NPT not very bleak. It's making us it bleak for the future. And therefore we have to take into mind that the declining years, the coming years might see a decline in the status of the NPT and the progress for non-proliferation which is not very good. So the question of CTBT, the question of FMCT, the question of the members which have acquired nuclear weapons beyond five, but which are not incorporated in the in the NPT. I think there's a big lacuna in the international politics that India, Pakistan, Israel, which is not a declared weapon state, although it has nuclear weapons, uh, they have not been accepted within the framework of the NPT. So this is a, a kind of a a kind of a vacuum which exists in the international politics, whether or not these countries will be taken or will not be taken. The possibility is in the near future or in the projectable future, they will not be made the members of the NPT, the nuclear weapon state members of the NPT. So therefore, this is another serious problem which exists in the, at that time. Uh, I won't dwell further on these very subjects. We have very eminent guest speakers to speak on this subject. And I, I will ask this, uh, Ayusha to kindly introduce fully the speaker, and then I will request him to come on the podium and deliver his answer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chim, and thank you for your acknowledgement, reviews, and remarks. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, today our chief guest is Lieutenant General Masar Jamil, currently Advisor Development and National Command Authority, and he was former Director, General Strategic Plans Division, Pakistan. He was commissioned in, utter, in an artillery regiment in 1981. General Officer is a graduate of Command and Staff College, Quetta Command, and General Staff College, Dhaka, National Defense University, Islamabad. He holds a master's degree in defense technologies from Peshawar University, defense studies from Dhaka University of Bangladesh, and war studies from National Defense University, Islamabad. The general officer carries with him a varied experience of command, staff, and instructional assignments. The general has served in Kashmir, a long line of control, Cholistan Desert, and Fata on operational duties. He has been in military operations directorate during 2001-2002 escalation with India and was Chief of Staff of course during Mumbai crisis. He has a good experience of internal security duties in interior sin as well. On the instructional side, he has been on the faculty of School of Artillery, School of Infantry and Tactics, Command and Staff College Quetta, National Defense University. The General Officer has commanded an Armored Divisional, Divisional Artillery and Infantry Brigade and Infantry Division. He also remained Commandant Pakistan Military Academy and then appointed Vice Chief of General Staff at GHQ. On the diplomatic front, he had an assignment of Defense Attaché in Embassy of Pakistan, Kazakhstan and was accredited to Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. He was promoted Lieutenant General in September 2013 and appointed Military Secretary at General Headquarters. He took over as Director General Strategic Plans Division in April 2015 till his retirement. Sir, I request you to please come to the rostrum and address the audience. <coughs> Thank you for the introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum. It is indeed a pleasure for me to be here today and speaking on the launch ceremony of the book Problems and Prospects of the Non Proliferation. Uh, let me first of all uh, appreciate and acknowledge. Strategic Green Institute's contributions in the domain of nuclear and strategic studies. 
these contributions have always helped enrich uh, and shape the strategic thinking. And we have always been very carefully reading whatever quality work the SPD has been producing in the last 10 years. Uh, I would like to really acknowledge that uh, since the SPA started its uh, work as an institution less than a decade ago, uh, the quality of work has always been the hallmark and uh, we have been very serious in reading every word that they have been actually writing. And actually this has been a credible source of strategic insight. Uh, I would like to uh, also appreciate uh, Dr. Zafari Palchima for his guidance and leadership to the SBI. Dr. Sir, your contributions are really valued by us. Uh, coming to the book, Problems and Prospects of the Non-Proliferation Regime, uh, uh, is the latest and I think a very comprehensive addition to the literature on challenges pertaining to the non-proliferation regime from a Pakistani vantage point. Uh, the book mostly focuses on problems and challenges within the non-proliferation regime, which is becoming increasingly politicized, and few states are monopolizing access to high-end technologies for peaceful uses in socio-economic development. <clears throat> in fact, we see the advent of nuclear weapons and global efforts to curtail their spread emerged almost simultaneously. The non-proliferation offered a grand bargain. Don't make nuclear weapons. <coughs> excuse me. Don't make nuclear weapons in exchange for access to nuclear technology for peaceful uses. The non-proliferation regime has indeed quite successfully stemmed horizontal proliferation. In 1950s, there was a prediction of about 25 nuclear states but there are nine nuclear weapon states more than a half a century later. <coughs> that said, the nuclear proliferation regime's creators have selectively fulfilled their end of the bargain. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in this increasing discrimination, all states are equal, but some seem to be more equal than others. The selective application of its rules has not only weakened the nuclear non-proliferation regime and regional strategic stability, it has posed a threat to the global and regional security as well. The accepted trade waiver in 2008 to a non-NSC member is just one example. Ambassador Tamir Akram in the book has pointed that these approaches of exceptionalism and discrimination within nuclear supplies group are further enabling and emboldening India. Making Indian nuclear program the fastest growing nuclear program today, with eight nuclear reactors outside IAEA safeguards, which will result in the deterioration of strategic stability in South Asia. Pakistan as a responsible nuclear state has always shown this trait only to respond to Indian destabilization ventures. And there is a legitimate security interest by Pakistan to stabilize and bring this stability to the strategic domain. There is a schism within the nuclear non-proliferation treaty signatories. Pakistan recognized the inherent discrimination in the treaty that divided the states in haves and haves nots and did not sign it like the two other nuclear powers. However, even as a non signatory to NPD, Pakistan has championed the principle of non proliferation and is proactively engaged at UN in the Conference of Disarmament, IAEA. And in initiatives like creating a parliament <coughs> for nuclear disarmament. Since some nuclear weapon states have still not been able to create an environment 
to read their NPT Article 6 obligation to this out. Thank you. Excuse me. <clears throat> I think the mask effect is predominant. <laughs> Since some nuclear battle states have still not been able to create an environment to meet the NPT in my, uh, Article 6 obligation, to this up, we have seen a very major development that 88 non member states, uh, nuclear weapon states of NPT, have elaborated a nuclear ban treaty that entered into force in January this year. And this speaks of the divergence and division between the signatories of the NPT that I mentioned earlier. Ladies and gentlemen, there is indeed a dilemma that the nuclear non-proliferation regime faces today. The NPT nuclear heads shall have to address the major challenges that the SPA book explains at length. I have just highlighted two leading challenges. I have resisted, uh, in fact, the temptation to quote uh, frequently uh, the scholarly arguments of the authors of this book, uh, but allow me to refer to some. Uh, I would like to first refer to Dr. Zafar Khan, who is the executive director of BTTN, who has rightly identified that the non-proliferation regimes institutional setup, politicized agenda, and behavior of key states remain the key challenges towards the stated intent, which is prevention of spread of fissile material while facilitating peaceful use of nuclear technology. Reinvigoration of the regime is a vital requirement now, and there is a need for concerted effort by states to resolve issues consensually in a non-biased and functionally operative manner. I would also refer to Dr. Tuhrul Jameen, yeah. who has also very aptly argued that the dissension among nuclear and non-nuclear weapon states on disarmament and the grand bargain have become a polarizing issue. This merits deeper reflection given the current global environment in which US and Russia are modernizing and focusing on their qualitative, qualitative improvement. Likewise, the issues raised by Dr. Paul uh, pertaining to our principal stance on physical material cutoff treaty are indeed reflective of the concerns within the country regarding the need to factor in existing stockpiles of physical material. Regrettably, in the last few years, the discriminating nuclear cooperation policies by some major powers undermining the international non-proliferation norms in pursuit of political power and profit have further accentuated the asymmetry in the physical material stocks in South Asia. Unless non-proliferation regime detoxifies itself and rids itself from the discriminating practices of few states, the NPT-based regime risks losing its vigor. If we seek a rule-based order, the rules shall have to be based on principles and applied without exceptions. Ladies and gentlemen, in spite of these odds, Pakistan has responsibly engaged in arms control, non-proliferation and disarmament structure. Pakistan has consistently contributed positively towards the regime, unlike a state seeking status by being a nuclear armed state, Pakistan developed a full spectrum deterrence capability for its genuine security reasons. This capability has been instrumental in maintaining strategic stability in its subcontinent in spite of Indian misadventurism. Ladies and gentlemen, a stable, multilateral, and non-discriminating, non-proliferation regime that improves its institutional mechanisms is what we will need to build a peaceful global environment. And that shall also bring much needed stability in South Asia. At the end, 
let me at the end let me say that there was a gap in pakistan literature on non proliferation and this and this book will contribute to fill in a very pivotal manner this following pakistan work offers an unbiased critique on the 75 year old non proliferation regime the discourse has so far been saturated by western and other literature i am sure that our younger generation should be able to look at the book and the new global nuclear order in a more unbiased manner and in a bright light that this book shines on the subject i am sure the book will give them the insight how the real politic is at play rather than higher objectives of this moment and non proliferation i would conclude once again by congratulating the eminent authors and as, well, as well as the editor for the timely and very rich contents of the book i'm sure that the book will be read with great interest in pakistan and elsewhere before i leave the rostam i would also like to thank a university for hosting the launch ceremony sir and i wish as we best of luck for their future endeavors thank you very much dear sir Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for your invaluable remarks and very detailed analysis. Now I request Dr. Zafar Iqbal Chinua to kindly present the copy of her book, Torch Leaf. So please. Thank you, thank you, sir, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, with this inaugural session of the book launch comes to an end. But before proceeding further, I would like to thank our chief guest, Lieutenant General Mr. Jamil Hilalim Tiaz Bhutia, sir. Thank you so much for gracing with your, us with your presence. I would also like to thank BC Air University Air Marshal Javed Ahmed Hilalim Tiaz Bhutia, sir. Thank you so much. And I also want to thank Dr. Zafar Iqbal Chima. And now I would like to request our chief guest, speakers. Authors and SVIS team to please assemble in front of the stage for a group photo. All the other guests are kindly requested to remain seated meanwhile. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, kindly please be assembled and seated so that we can begin session two. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. I'm so thankful. Thank you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience and welcome to session two. Today we are honored to have VC Air University Air Marshal Javed Ahmed Hilani Mkiaz military with us who will chair this session. Sir, I request you to take your seat on the stage as the chair of the session. <coughs> Air Marshal Javed Ahmed is Vice Chancellor of Air University. He holds a master's degree in defense and strategic studies from Air War College and master's degree in war studies from National Defense University, Islamabad. In his 40 years of commissioned service as a fighter pilot with Pakistan Air Force, the Air Marshal flew several fighter aircraft and served in senior command and staff assignments. These include command of the prestigious Combat Commander School and Operational Air Base, Assistant Chief, Chief of the Air Staff Plans. Chief Project Director of the JF-17 Fighter Production Program in command of the Pakistan Aeronautical Complex, Kamra. After retirement, the Air Marshal served as the Director of Policy and Doctrine at the Center for Aerospace and Security Studies. In recognition of his meritorious services, the Air Marshal has been decorated with Tamba Imtiaz, Sitar Imtiaz, and Hilali Imtiaz military. Sir, so thank you so much for joining us today. Now I would like to introduce and request our worthy speakers of today panel to come to the stage who are also authors in this book. So I first of all request Ambassador Zameer Akram to please, please take your seat on the stage, sir. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Today our second speaker is Dr. Ghulam Mujadid. Sir, please come to the stage and take your seat. Our third speaker is Professor Dr. Zafar Nawaz Ispal, so please come to the stage and take your seat. I also request Dr. Rabia Akhtar, who is the reviewer of the book, to come to the stage and take your seat. Ma'am, please. so I will present the abridged versions of their bios to you. Our first speaker is Ambassador Zameer Akram. Today we will be deliberating on nuclear non-proliferation regime, past dynamics and current assessment. Ambassador Zameer Akram is currently advisor to the Strategic Plans Division. He has served as a Pakistan investor and permanent representative to the United Nations and other international organizations in Geneva from 2008 till 2015. In 2015, Ambassador Akram was elected as a chair rapporteur of the Human Rights Council Working Group on the Right to Development. He has served in the former Soviet Union, India, the United States, and United Nations. As additional foreign secretary in the Prime Minister's office from 2004 to 2008, and also served as the Prime Minister Sherpa on the UN Secretary General High Level for UN Reforms. Ambassador Akram holds a master's degree in international relations from London School of Economics and Political Science. He served as the honorary dean of the Geneva School of Diplomacy during 2010, where he was awarded, awarded as an honorary doctorate. Ambassador Akram retired from Pakistan Foreign Service in October 2015. Today, our second speaker is Dr. Ghulam Mujadid. He is assistant professor at Air University. Today, he will be deliberating on politics of nuclear security options for Pakistan. 
Dr. Banan Mujahid recently published his book titled State Society Conflict in Pakistan, A Psychosocial Perspective from the Iqbal International Institute for Research and Dialogue, Islamabad. He has been acting dean and HOD faculty of aerospace science and strategic studies from July 2015 to October 2020 and served as a registrar at university from July 2013 to July 2015. He has been associated with NDU as an assistant professor and acting HOD Department of Strategic Studies at Faculty of Contemporary Studies, and he has served as a senior research fellow in Institute of Strategic Studies at Islamabad as well. Before joining the academia, Dr. Ghulam Jadid has had a full career in Pakistan Air Force, where he served for 33 long years as fighter pilot, flying most of the PAF's frontline combat aircraft. He retired as the Air Commodore in July 20, 2012 and started to pursue his academic and research career. Dr. Ghulam Jadid had the opportunity to serve at the prestigious collegiate institution of PAF and other defense forces, which include PAF, Air War College, National Defense College, and National Defense University Islamabad for four years. Dr. Ghulam Jadid is holders of three MSc degrees in strategic studies. He completed his PhD in strategic studies from Kaikazam University in March 2018. He continues to teach as an assistant professor at the Department of Aerospace and Strategic Studies at Yale University. Today, our third speaker is Professor Dr. Zafar Nawaz Jaspal, and his topic of deliberation is Pakistan and FMCT, the current debate. Currently, Dr. Jaspal is professor at the School of Politics and International Relations, Qayyad Azam University, Islamabad. Dr. Jaspal is a widely published scholar with more than 125 academic research papers, monographs, and chapters in edited volumes published in Pakistan and overseas. He recently authored India's Surgical Strike Strategic Brinksman and Responses book in April 2019. He also authored a book titled Nuclear Risk Reduction Myers and Restrain Regime in South Asia in 2004. Dr. Jaspal has been associated with various national organizations and think tanks, which include Foreign Services Academy, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Institute of Strategic Studies, and is IPRI. Professor Jaspal is a guest speaker visiting. Has is also delivering as lectures as a guest speaker and still continues to deliver lecture at many professional and training institutes including distinguished NATO school Germany, NATO Defense College Rome, Center of Excellence Defense Against Terrorism Turkey, National Security and War Courses of Pakistan, National Defense University, Intelligence Bureau Academy, Command and Staff College Quetta, Air War College Karachi and Pakistan Naval War College and also in the Foreign Services Academy. Professor Jaspal holds a PhD in MP in International Relations and MA in Political Science. He is the alumna of European Peace University of Austria, Oslo University of Norway, and Sandia National University, Sandia National Laboratory, Laboratories, United States. Today we also have a Dr. Rabia Akhtar in our panel as a reviewer. Dr. Rabia Akhtar is Director for Security, Strategy, and Policy Research, University of Lahore. She is a founding director of the School of Integrated Social Sciences at the University of Lahore, Pakistan. Dr. Akhtar is a member of the Pakistan Advisory Council on Foreign Affairs. She is a non-resident fellow at the South Asia Center at Atlantic Council of Washington, D.C. Dr. Akhtar holds a PhD in Security Studies from Kansas University. She is a Fulbright alumna. Dr. Akhtar received her Master's in International Relations from Qayyad Azam University and her Master's in Political Science from Eastern University, Illinois, USA. She has written extensively on South Asian nuclear security and defense dynamics. She is also the author of the book titled The Blind Eye, the U.S. Non Proliferation Policy Towards Pakistan from Ford to Clinton. Dr. Akhtar is also the editor of Pakistan Political, Pakistan's first strategic and foreign affairs magazine. With this introduction, now I would like to hand over the session to our worthy chair. Over to you, sir. as well as some other think tanks and I think after this uh, uh, function today uh, we will sign an MOU with Dr. Rabia uh, to, uh, in our efforts to collaborate further. Uh, a University is also looking at expanding its uh, faculty 
of uh, strategic studies uh, and we have just introduced a course on international relations at the BS level too. I think it's a very apt occasion, uh, the launch of the book and then a discussion session on an important topic uh, for Pakistan. Uh, if you understand how the regimes move today and what is the world order and what challenges are faced in the uh, nuclear non-proliferation regimes, uh, I think there is always a perspective that Pakistan has to present. And I agree with Dr. Zafar's uh, contention that the literature on this subject uh, from the Pakistani perspective is uh, there's a dearth of that literature in the international market. So from that perspective, I think today is an important day where a perspective and thoughts on the uh, on our perspective of Pakistan can be shared. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you look at the global nuclear uh, non-proliferation regime, uh, I would term this that it is under stress due to the diverging priorities of the major nuclear powers and the inability of the international community to develop a consensus on a set of norms that could address security interests of all countries. Now this situation is nothing new and if you look at how the situation of COVID developed, it was difficult for the international community to develop a consensus on a serious issue as of COVID. Also the growing trends of discrimination that are guided by the geostrategic considerations of major powers has further undermined the credibility of the international non-proliferation regime. And from that perspective, the India-US strategic partnership and more specifically, the controversial India-US Civil Nuclear Cooperation Agreement of 2008 has brought into question the legitimacy of several formal and informal arrangements such as the NPT and the nuclear supplies program. Now these are very interesting issues and I think we have a very worthy panel to discuss them uh, in detail. Uh, I will not hold you further and ask Mr. Uh, to please take the stage and present his views on nuclear non-proliferation regime, past dynamics and the current assessment. that we need to keep in mind uh, when we are talking about uh, proliferation but especially nuclear proliferation. The first is that as in everything else, geopolitics is the bottom line. It's geopolitics that determines a country's uh, non-proliferation uh, policy or proliferation policy uh, and uh, that is no exception for whether you are a great power or a medium or a small size country. The second is the dual use of particularly nuclear technology, whereby it is obviously very important 
for uh, power generation, medicine, agriculture, other peaceful uses, but can also be diverted towards production of nuclear weapons. So this dual use uh, creates a kind of dichotomy in the possession of nuclear uh, capability uh, and raises suspicions about how far a country intends to go uh, with that capability. And the third, of course, aspect is the issue of security. Uh, some countries, or most countries, would pursue nuclear weapons because of their security concerns, as is the case of Pakistan. But there are also some countries uh, that, aside from security, also pursue nuclear weapons for the purposes of prestige, which I think uh, describes the status or the motivations, particularly of countries like India or France. So let me now come to talking about the nuclear non-proliferation regime, but here I think it's best that we understand that it's, when we're talking about the non-proliferation regime, it's strictly not possible to distinguish between nuclear non-proliferation and broadly non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. So everything that deals with all these nuclear, chemical, biological, uh, missiles, whatever is related to this uh, option that is something that is part of the non-proliferation regime. Now, <clears throat> the, uh, Professor uh, Chima has described what he, uh, I think aptly described, what is the non-proliferation regime. And it is a collection of international agreements and organizations, as well as national laws and policies among nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states to prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons, and if you take the broader definition, as I said, prevent the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. So the main pillar, uh, especially when we are talking about uh, nuclear non-proliferation, the main pillar of this regime is, of course, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And as I'm sure we all know, there are five recognized nuclear weapon states, uh, countries that conducted nuclear tests before 1968, which was the cutoff date. And those countries that are known as non-nuclear weapon states. And the essential aspect of the non-proliferation treaty is that it is a grand bargain, as General Mazar Jameel pointed out. It is a grand bargain between the nuclear weapon states and the non-nuclear weapon states, whereby the non-nuclear weapon states have agreed voluntarily to forego the acquisition of nuclear weapons in return for two things. One, support assistance by the nuclear weapon states and the international community international organizations such as the IAEA uh, to develop their peaceful uses of nuclear technology under international full scope safeguards. And the second part of this bargain is that the nuclear weapon states have committed to a eventual goal of general, universal and complete nuclear disarmament. And that's the theoretical part. Now, the problem is that it gets stuck in what I said is geopolitics. And therefore, the limitations of the NPT. First of all, several countries, especially led by India, rejected the NPT as being discriminatory and they termed it as nuclear apartheid. Several other countries also rejected it at that time. Pakistan was one of them. Uh, but our objective was not so much anti-non-proliferation or anti-apartheid, nuclear apartheid, but to keep our options open vis-a-vis -vis India 
which we knew even before the NPD was signed or finalized, uh, was already on a path towards developing nuclear weapons in a clandestine program. So we wanted to keep our options open. Others among those who rejected it were, of course, Israel, uh, Argentina, Brazil, France, uh, which countries were these, which all of these countries were driven by their own geopolitical considerations. So, the first aspect is that it is not a treaty that is, it has a very large number of members, but it is not a treaty that includes all those countries that have the capacity to produce nuclear weapons. The second problem with NPT is that while it bans horizontal proliferation, that is distribution or development along horizontal lines between different countries, it does not prevent vertical proliferation by the nuclear weapon states by achieving a more deadlier, more, de more destructive levels of nuclear uh, weapons capabilities. So that's another very important problem uh, with, with the NPT. The third problem is that the nuclear weapon states have demonstrated a lack of commitment towards the goal of universal and complete nuclear disarmament which is what they had agreed to do. And they have talked about a step-by-step -step approach uh, without agreeing to any kind of deadline for this. And in effect, what they have actually done to demonstrate from their point of view a commitment to disarmament is really processes for arms control uh, or processes for non-proliferation. In my view, uh, treaties uh, that were concluded, such as the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, the CTPT, was really a non-proliferation objective. It was not a disarmament objective because it did not decrease the number of nuclear weapons uh, that, that existed uh, at that time and even now. So these are some of the problems uh, limited, uh, extending to the NPT. We should also take into account associated agreements with the NPT and these briefly I will mention as the Partial Test Ban Treaty, the Seabed Treaty, the Outer Space Treaty, the CTBT which I just mentioned. And then there are several organizations and institutions that are part of this architecture of the non-proliferation non machine and these include of course the IAEA the Nuclear Suppliers Group, the Missile Technology Control Regime, the, the other uh, cartels such as the Watsonar Arrangement, Australia Group. And then there is the unique uh, association of countries in a geographical region. There are six of them in different parts of the world which are called nuclear weapon-free zones starting with the Treaty of Tertulelco in, in Latin America and the Caribbean and then has spread to other parts of the world. And then of course there's a very important role that is played by global organizations, multilateral organizations such as the United Nations itself and <clears throat> the Conference on Disarmament which came into, uh, came, came into being after the first UN special session on nuclear disarmament, the SSOD-1. In addition, there are related agreements. We don't deal with nuclear weapons per se, but they are important parts of the non-proliferation regime. The Biological Weapons Convention, the Chemical Weapons Convention, and then a number of arms control agreements, particularly between the major powers, SORT, the series of SORT treaties, uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union, and then the START Treaty between the United States and Russia, and the ABM Treaty, as well as the Intermediate Forces Range, the INF Treaty. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> let me talk about the current assessment of, uh, of the non-proliferation regime. Any assessment of this regime would actually go back to 1974, because within a few years of the conclusion of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, one of the non-signatories, India, conducted its first 
nuclear test in 1974. This was a, in many ways, of course, we all know the impact that it had on Pakistan, but it also had an impact on the non-proliferation regime as it had existed up to that point, because it demonstrated that the IAEA and other institutions and measures to ensure non-proliferation were not airtight, they were not uh, capable of preventing uh, proliferation as, as India had de demonstrated, leading to, of course, the creation of the London Club or the London Group, and then which then became the nuclear suppliers. Group. I think this is important because it has an impact on where we are today. But before I come to that, let me just mention the 1998 nuclear tests by India and then by Pakistan, resulting in criticism against these two countries, in particular UN Security Council Resolution 1172, which among other things decreed that no country, whether nuclear weapon state or non-nuclear weapon state, should engage in any kind of nuclear cooperation with either India or Pakistan. And so this is important because in 2004-2005 uh, we witnessed the impact of geopolitics on the non-proliferation regime and that was as a result of the Indo-US strategic partnership and the Indo-US nuclear deal, the 123 agreement, which on the one hand was a violation of the NPT Articles 1 and 2, Article 6. It was also a violation of Resolution 1172 of the UN Security Council. It was a violation also of US and other national laws of several other countries that subsequently engaged in nuclear cooperation uh, with India. So, the reason why it is important to understand the impact of this Indo-US agreement, which is basically aimed against China and therefore has a geopolitical purpose, led to the NSG waiver for India in 2008. And this waiver, at least in my view, uh, if you wish to read my article um, in my uh, contribution in this book, uh, goes in detail as to how uh, the NSG waiver for India and the broader US-India agreement has actually added to nuclear proliferation, has undermined the nuclear non-proliferation uh, non proliferation regime, and has exacerbated the nuclear and strategic arms race, uh, not just between India and Pakistan, but, we, but, but on a quadrilateral level between India, Pakistan, China, and the United States. So, <clears throat> let me, I will not go further on to this. The other aspects of the current uh, situation is regional non-proliferation issues relating to Iran, uh, suspicions about Iran's nuclear program, and the landmark agreement that was reached by the Obama administration along with several other countries with Iran called the JCPOA, which of course uh, the subsequent President Trump uh, withdrew from and now the Biden administration is trying to re, uh, revive, but it is uh, proving difficult uh, for reasons that would take us beyond the topic uh, today, but certainly uh, it is not as easy to, uh, to rejoin the JCPOA uh, because a lot of water has, uh, has flown under the bridge uh, since the US uh, withdrew from it. And the other regional proliferation issue is of course North Korea. And this again uh, has been a part of a multilateral effort, the six party talks, uh, certain assurances were given to the, uh, to the North Koreans in the early uh, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, uh, which were not honored, 
forcing the, well, leading to the North Korean withdrawal from the NPT and subsequently testing their nuclear weapons. So again, um, in both cases, whether it is Iran or North Korea, the underlying problem or the underlying issue here is security. And uh, that is something which needs to be addressed in order for the, 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 the nuclear programs of these countries uh, to be contained. Another blow to the non-proliferation regime has been the withdrawal of the United States from the ABM Treaty, the INF Treaty, and the Open Skies Treaty. Recently, the US and Russia uh, agreed to uh, renew the START Treaty, uh, but still there are problems in their bilateral relations, uh, which I will come to in a bit. The other elements relating to the non-proliferation regime which we need to take into account is that a number of non nuclear non-weapon states have raised concerns about the humanitarian impact of the use of nuclear weapons. So this has become a very important part of the ongoing debate relating to nuclear weapons and this humanitarian impact on the use of nuclear weapons uh, process was started in 2013 by, by Norway and has been continued by Mexico and several other countries. In 2017, as a result of the frustration by the non-nuclear weapon states over the lack of progress on nuclear disarmament, they adopted, yeah, I'm just about to finish. They adopted the Nuclear Weapon Ban Treaty in 2017, which was ratified with the, with the requisite number of signatories in 2021. But the treaty is not legally binding. It is a political declaration more than a legally binding treaty. And it was obviously uh, being opposed by the nuclear weapon states. What we are witnessing today <coughs> is a renewed round of vertical proliferation by all the major powers, including uh, also by India. And what we are also witnessing today is a development of new war fighting or new weapons technologies using uh, not only space as the fourth domain, air, land, sea, and space, but also cyberspace and other forms of uh, war fighting capabilities including artificial intelligence, robotics, lethal autonomous weapons uh, and there's, there's a whole list of uh, kind of new weapons technologies that are being developed regarding which there is no legal regime, there is no non-proliferation regime, there is no control, there is no agreement on, uh, on these uh, kinds of weapons. And what is most important or dangerous is that these technologies, especially cyber technologies, uh, is, are not limited to nation states, but can also and are also in the hands of non-state actors and perhaps also terrorists. So uh, that causes a major challenge uh, as we go forward uh, for the uh, international non-proliferation regime. So I will hand you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think this is a very important perspective uh, covered by uh, Ambassador uh, Zameer Akram, where he talked about the uh, geopolitics dual use security uh, element. But I think the important uh, thing which emerged in the end was there are new regimes of control also uh, which are emerging as technology changes. Uh, I think after this useful uh, uh, talk, this brings us to uh, the discussion on the politics of nuclear security and the options for Pakistan and I would request Dr. Ulam Jaldit to share his thoughts with us.
بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام و السلام علیہ رسول الکریم آئی تھینک ڈاکٹر ظفر اقبال چیما سر فار انکلوڈنگ مائی ہمبل آرٹیکل ان یور ویری گلوریس ورک اینڈ بک آئی فیل آنرڈ فار دیٹ اینڈ آلسو آئی ایم تھینک فل ٹو ہمیشا فار اے ویری نائس انٹروڈکشن تھینک یو اینڈ آئی ایم تھینک فل فار دا چیئر دا سیشن Uh, for uh, inviting me to speak uh, on this topic. NPT, and I think a lot of points have been covered very ably so by Ambassador Zameer Akram, especially towards the end that he talked of nuclear terrorism and uh, pointed out to various limitations of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and the regime itself. Uh, NPT is based on three pillars. nuclear non-proliferation, nuclear disarmament, and peaceful uses of nuclear energy. But it suffers from serious compliance issues, lacks on effective and effective enforcement mechanism, and depends on good faith of the state parties that are involved, chiefly the permanent five, the P5 that Ambassador explained. Uh, it also does not directly cater for nuclear safety and nuclear ambitions of the non-state actors. Nuclear non-proliferation treaty also suffers from a basic scientific dilemma that there is little difference between peaceful and military uses of nuclear technology because scientific laws, processes and technology for producing nuclear weapons are the same that produce peaceful uses of nuclear energy. Conversion from peaceful to military uses requires enriching uranium to higher levels or reprocessing uranium into uh, plutonium. So this process is actually similar in the peaceful uses as well as in the military uses if the levels of enrichment were enhanced somehow. This security gap in the non-proliferation regime is becoming more pronounced due to open source formal knowledge available uh, of nuclear technology and engineering and rise of negative non-state actors uh, with political ambitions. Then Chernobyl, Three Mile Island and Japanese nuclear accident, they have revealed that nuclear industry lacks sufficient safety oversight as well. Nuclear safety is the achievement of proper operating conditions prevention of accidents or mitigation of accident consequences resulting in protection of workers, the public and the environments from undue radiation hazards. Based on this security and safety gap, there has emerged the global nuclear security regime that has become one of the main pillars of uh, nuclear proliferation regime as a whole. This regime is based on international conventions United Nations Security Council resolutions, formal and informal arrangements of nuclear security and safety, and they are also the very instruments upon which the politics of nuclear security and safety. I think this is a very important perspective uh, covered by uh, Ambassador uh, Zameer Akram, where he talked about the uh, geopolitics dual use security uh, element. But I think the important uh, thing which emerged in the end was there are new regimes of control also uh, which are emerging as technology changes. Uh, I think after this useful uh, uh, talk, this brings us to uh, the discussion on the politics of nuclear security and the options for Pakistan and I would request Dr. Ghulam Ajadid to share his thoughts with us. بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم اصلاۃ والسلام علیہ رسول الکریم آئی تھینک ڈاکٹر ظفر اقبال چیما سر فار انکلوڈنگ مائی ہمبل آرٹیکل ان یور ویری گلوریس ورک اینڈ بک آئی فیل آنڈر فار دیٹ 
And also, I th I'm thankful uh, to Arusha for a very nice introduction. Thank you. And uh, I'm thankful for the chair, the session, uh, for uh, inviting me to speak uh, on this topic. NPT, and I think a lot of points have been covered very ably so by Ambassador Zamir Akram, especially towards the end that he talked of nuclear terrorism and uh, pointed out the various limitations of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and the regime itself. Uh, NPT is based on three pillars, nuclear non-proliferation, nuclear disarmament, and peaceful uses of nuclear energy. But it suffers from serious compliance issues, lacks on effective and effective enforcement mechanism, and depends on good faith of the state parties that are involved, chiefly the permanent fight, the P5 that Ambassador explained. Uh, it also does not directly cater for nuclear safety and nuclear ambitions of the non-state actors. Nuclear non proliferation Treaty also suffers from a basic scientific dilemma that there is little difference between peaceful and military uses of nuclear technology because scientific laws, processes and technology for producing nuclear weapons are the same that produce peaceful uses of nuclear energy. Conversion from peaceful to military uses requires enriching uranium to higher levels or reprocessing uranium into uh, plutonium. So this process is actually similar in the peaceful uses as well as in the military uses if the levels of enrichment were enhanced somehow. This security gap in the non-proliferation regime is becoming more pronounced due to open source formal knowledge available uh, of nuclear technology and engineering and rise of negative non-state actors uh, with political ambitions. Then Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and Japanese nuclear accident, they have revealed that nuclear industry lacks sufficient safety oversight as well. Nuclear safety is the achievement of proper operating conditions, prevention of accidents or mitigation of accident consequences resulting in protection of workers, the public, and the environments from undue radiation hazards. Based on this security and safety gap, there has emerged the global nuclear security regime that has become one of the main pillars of uh, nuclear proliferation regime as a whole. This regime is based on international conventions, United Nations Security Council resolutions, formal and informal arrangements of nuclear security and safety, and they are also the very instruments upon which the politics of nuclear security and safety is being played. There are two definitions, broadly, of the nuclear security. One is according to International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, which is a political and technical definition that nuclear security is the prevention and detection of and response to theft, sabotage, unauthorized access, illegal transfer, or other malicious acts involving nuclear material, radioactive substances, or their associate facilities. The other definition is political one, and it links nuclear security with terrorists themselves, especially the Islamist jihadist groups, that nuclear weapons and material might fall into the hands of Islamist jihadist elements who might then use them against the West. This definition is biased and really shallow because it links nuclear terrorism to a particular group, whereas proclivity to use nuclear terrorism may reside in the dark psychological abysses of some human beings who could belong to any civilization, any region, and any religion. Political definition is also self-serving because it provides the powerful states and their allies a pretext to increase their political, economic, and strategic manipulation of the Muslim states. Pakistan is viewed from the lens of the same definition, and there are so-called apprehensions 
that its nuclear weapons or materials might fall in the terrorist hand. This politicization of nuclear security is risky and dangerous for international system because it ignores other more likely uh, perpetrators of nuclear terrorism that are not visible. Uh, Robert M. Frost, he authored a very foundational book on nuclear, nuclear terrorism after 9-11. He believes that, but fear of that most terrifying image, a terrorist with atomic bomb, should not blind us to the need to prevent and defend against the much more probable forms of nuclear terrorism. That is, attack on nuclear reactors to other, or other elements of nuclear fuel cycle and radiological dispersal devices powered by industrial or uh, medical radiation sources. By the same token, for all the focus on jihadist Islamist terrorism, other groups might, under certain circumstances, be more dangerous. Nuclear security regime comprises international conventions, United Nations Security Council resolution, and a host of formal and informal arrangements governing the security of nuclear materials and nuclear power plants, nuclear facilities, and nuclear weapons within a state to protect them from violent non-state actors and malicious actors. Basic international focus of nuclear security regime is that domestic nuclear security is the responsibility of the states, the nuclear states themselves or the states who have the nuclear facilities and capabilities. United Nations Non-Proliferation and Nuclear Security Watchdog IAEA has issued the additional protocols and safety codes regarding the nuclear security and Pakistan has adopted the additional pro protocol and goes along with the safety codes of the IAEA. UN International Convention on Physical Protection of Nuclear Material, CPPNM, is a legally binding convention to suppress threat of nuclear terrorism by establishing measures related to the prevention, detection, and punishment of offensing, offenses relating to the nuclear material. In 2005, amendment to CPPNM legally binds states to protect their nuclear facilities and material during peaceful domestic use, storage, transport, and provides for enhanced cooperation between states regarding uh, rapid location and recovery of stolen or smuggled nuclear materials. Pakistan has ratified uh, this convention and the 2005 amendment also. The, then there are Security Council Revolution, uh, Resolution 17, uh, 1373, and 1540, and 1887. Then are the final uh, documents of the Rev. Uh, review conferences till uh, 2010 all contribute and stipulate measures uh, related to the nuclear uh, safety and uh, this thing. Pakistan regularly participates in these uh, things and submits religiously its country reports as a requirement of the resolution 1540 and other. United Nations General Assembly adopted International Convention on Suppression of Acts of Nuclear Terrorism we will call it accent on 13th uh, uh, April 2005. It's a legally binding convention which comprises 28 articles and called, uh, calls for, uh, it's also called as Nuclear Terrorism Convention. Accent criminalizes acts of nuclear terrorism and requires government to either prosecute suspected terrorists in domestic courts or extradite them to their home countries. It encourages increased exchanges of information and greater cooperation between countries in pursuit of terrorist, uh, terrorist suspects. Accent mentions preventive nuclear security measures and urges states to ensure protection of radioactive material while taking into account the recommendations of IAEA. The convention was put into force on 7 July 2007. Pakistan has not signed that convention but is actively considering to do so. Accent applies exclusively to acts committed by civilian individuals. It does not cover states. Uh, the nuclear terrorism by state has come to haunt the international system because there is a long list of uh, the physical air strikes that were carried out 
on nuclear power plants of Iraq and Syria by Israeli uh, aeroplanes, and they completely destroyed uh, uh, these reactors. And what if they they were you know active and um, uh, they could have been like uh, you know radiational bombs? And same specter could have been you know uh, reenacted by this. Similarly, uh, in the cyber attacks. They are after Iran's nuclear facilities, and I think uh, the Iranian foreign minister also has called the latest uh, cyber attack uh, on Natanz facility as uh, terrorism, and has reiterated that it has the right to to take the revenge or something. So this very aspect, nuclear terrorism by the hands of non-state actors, is okay. It's understood. But this act is also a very basic form of nuclear terrorism, and I think Pakistan, along with the international community and the United Nations, uh, needs to uh, the seek a redress uh, to uh, this aspect also. It's a very important part of the uh, nuclear security regime, I think. The nuclear security regime ha also has some informal arrangements that um, some of them were talked about by Ambassador Zimiakram. And we have this um, um, cooperative threat reduction program, G8 initiative on nuclear security, PSI, proliferation security initiative, and uh, Zanger committee and nuclear supply groups, was in our arrangement, Australia group, nuclear, four nuclear security summits that have taken place. Pakistan has participated in each one of them and given its national statements. The Indo-US nuclear deal and ongoing bids to include India in NSE indicates that informal arrangements make up the major arena of nuclear security politics. In the international arena, political arena, principles and ideals of NPT and nuclear security regime are often compromised by the major powers for the sake of their political, strategic and economic issues. And that is what the nuclear, uh, the politics about uh, nuclear proliferation and nuclear security is all about. Future trend: uh, the Pakistan's you know, uh, lensing of uh, the terrorism continues in the same thing. And uh, I will just quickly go on to a few options for Pakistan. Pakistan should consider signing the ratify, uh, signing and uh, ratifying the accent. It must use its right not to accept certain clauses that uh, it thinks are not in its favor, like other countries have done. But I think it is important that Pakistan becomes member of uh, the accent. Pakistan's diplomatic community has the requisite promise to safeguard country's interest, and we should rely on that. Apart from nuclear supply group, Pakistan must initiate effort to become member of the Vasina ar arrangement. And Australia group, they are not the forbidden peace for us. We must uh, be confident and we are actually capable of becoming members uh, of, of these groups as well. Uh, Pakistan should exhibit uh, confidence and prudence of genuine nuclear state by joining MTCR, this missile technology cut-off regime. This is um, entirely based on my uh, optimism about Pakistan and it will increase its standing. Pakistan's ratification of CPPNM and its amendment is very good and it must continue. We need to continue uh, our constructive uh, engagement with IAEA and further boost the, the already uh, wholehearted cooperation uh, with the global uh, international uh, cooperation on the nuclear terrorism and United Nations resolutions. Pakistan's publishing of nuclear security regime document in 2020 is a glorious milestone in her journey of nuclear security. In 2020, uh, the Nuclear Threat Initiative ranking declared Pakistan as the most improved country in terms of nuclear security, and that is the immediate dividend of this uh, milestone document that we have received. Uh, then, of course, we need to continue our uh, effort to strengthen the physical security, including the cyber security and also the insider threat. Pakistan's inherent potential are strong and it needs to engage the world with the strength of resilient society, political stability, humane culture and diplomatic progress. Nuclear security is vital, first of all, for the people of Pakistan and for the people of the world at large. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you.
Dr. Mujadde, I think he's covered some very important aspects. Uh, Pakistan has always been under scrutiny uh, because of its nuclear program by virtue of being the only sole Muslim nuclear power. I think uh, uh, Dr. Mujadde covered many areas uh, in which he touched upon the linkage between the small gap between the peaceful and the military use of uh, such technology. I think his views on what treaties to join and what not to join will definitely solicit comments by other worthy uh, panelists because some of these treaties have a lot of uh, things on the agenda besides uh, the perspective of uh, joining the treaty alone. Uh, so I think this was a very useful talk. Uh, we now move on to uh, a talk on Pakistan and the FMCT, uh, the current debate and for that we have Dr. Zafar, Zafar Nawaz Jaspal to uh, share his views with us. As far as I let me start thanking the chair for inviting me to present my views and at the same time to congratulate the Professor Chima and his team for producing this book. I concur what the Professor Chima in the beginning said that the stakeholders must rely. There is a publishing culture, there is a timing. When we publish, when we write books, they are meant for filling the gap. Delay of four five years is always very much undermining the objective of the world. At the same time, I appreciate Jima Saab's, you can say, patience that contacting again and again these uh, your contributors and asking them to update is very difficult, and especially it's very difficult for me as a contributor to read and revise again and again after every one year the same article or same thing. So this is a very important challenge for us, especially when we are publishing in the edited books or our own books that the stakeholders must understand that what is the time frame. Thank you very much for this. Let me start my today's presentation. And Pakistan FMCT current debate. I have taken a few points from my chapter and at the same time I try to make it more keeping in mind the title of this current debate. That what is happening today, what was irrelevant or you can say became obsolete in my chapter but let me start with this. There are four constructs for understanding the current debate. One is philosophical construct, second is scope of the mandate, Sharon mandate, which we call it, let's say, scope of the CTBT, uh, FMCT negotiation at the CD. Third is great power politics, and my final is the India-Pakistan strategic right. So these are the four, you can say, factors which contribute or determine the discourse on the FLCP. Let me identify and share with you my five points which I say philosophical construct or without addressing them, no arms control or disarmament treaty is possible. Especially in a strategic environment, the current strategic global and regional strategic environment. In this context, my first point is the arms control and disarmament initiatives are the product of the regional and international strategic environment. So if anyone is not taking into account these the regional or global strategic environment trends, then I think it's a wrong approach to demand from any other country to try this kind of initiative arms control and disarmament. The second point here is that in the prevailing anarchical international system, Sovereign states have to rely on their own self-help strategy for the survival and thereby an arms control and disarmament agreement treaty which undermines their defensive defense is bound to be straightforwardly rejected. I think Pakistan is one of those states which experience that extended defensive umbrella is not reliable. Your survival depends on your self-help basis and that was I'm referring to 1971 trend. 
My third point is that in the realm of the high politics, national interest, defined in terms of commercial and military context, is a deterministic variable rather than idealistic non-proliferation norms. And that point can be qualified by focusing on Indo-US strategic partnership, Indo-US nuclear deal, and the Krad Vika or Kolkata. My full point in this is that international treaties or agreements formation is very much based on two principles, reciprocity between sacrifices and benefits, and on principle of universality. So whenever we have to focus on the facility or cut-off treaty or this kind of the thing, we must not forget this principle. Finally, the conventional arms control and disarmament is a prerequisite of for nuclear arms control and disarmament between among the regional and global strategic competitors. Ambassador Zavira had already pointed out this. So let me come on the now second point, the scope of the FMCT, which was defined by the Shannon Mandate presented at the Conference of Disarmament on March 24, 1995. Now, from there, the debate is whether this is arms control or disarmament. The negotiations on the Fisalmo Treaty on FMCT, they are very much, you can say, based on the US 2009 proposal in which they said that the future, they must be banned only on the future production of the Fisalmo material. And from there, and keeping in mind the Shannon Mandate, it falls in the category of the arms control. FMCT would not only ban future production of fissile material, but also re reduce or deal with the reduction of existing, st existing stockpiles, number of the states, including Pakistan, maintain the stance that the treaty must be having a disarmament in its scope. So if there is a controversy, this controversy existed, in the last two, three decades, will continue. So the stockpiling or the existing stockpiles will remain controversial. There was another problem, verification or unverified approach. I think in the Obama, the Obama administration addressed it and they agreed for a verification, whereas the earlier Bush administration was not in that favor. But even if we can resolve this issue of <coughs> verification, Still, we need to resolve the issue of existing stockpiles. My third point, which I said that was with reference to the great power politics. The great power strategic competition has already started, and in this context, my reference is that this, uh, due to this competition, the arms control structure, which was very much conceived, institutionalized during the last phase of the Cold War, is fracturing. When I say fracturing, it is almost in the process of demise. 1972 ABM Treaty, which was the basis of the arms control, it is no more there. And Americans also existed from the 1987 INF Treaty, and that's why that is not there. The American Space Force drive Russians and they also increase the Chinese investment, Indians, and you can say anti satellite tests. These all, you can say, developments. We really, that there is a very fragile support for the prevention of an arms race in outer space. So, if we have not these kind of things there, what we find? We find that a new era of US Russia strategic competition is underway, including China there. The term competition, let me emphasize on this. The term competition first appeared in the Russian foreign policy concept in 2008. Theoretically speaking, in the process of competition, states determine exactly how the world will be organized, who will initiate the rules by which it acts, and who will become the main beneficiary from the application of these rules. This is a problem which you witness in the Americans' Indo-Pacific strategy, so much in India's Indo-Pacific strategy, and these kind of things in the competition. The constructs of the Moscow Washington unfolding competition will shape the geopolitical environment, regulation, and also the arms control or disarmament debate in the regional and global politics. 
We have to also not ignore, despite the extension of the New START Treaty for the next five years, still they have a bigger stockpiles of the nuclear weapons. Let me here re-emphasize what is happening in, the mosque, uh, in Washington today. You have to read the United States nuclear poster, 2018 nuclear poster in the document, in which they advocated or they demand or invest more in the tactical weapons, new modernization of the nuclear, modernization of the nuclear weapons, missile defense systems. So what this gives? New generations of the nuclear weapons will be developed by the Americans. That is their current policy. President Biden on February 10, 2021 said, we need to take on the dangers and opportunities of emerging technologies, enhance our capabilities in the cyberspace, and show that we are positioned, in, positioned to lead a new era of competition from the deep sea to outer space. This is a message which we have to keep in mind when we talk about the arms control of these kind of things. So, Russian Federation, the Russian ruling elite, seems confident about the country's nuclear weapons modernization. On January 15, 2020, President Putin said, for the first time, I want to emphasize this, for the first time, the history of nuclear missile weapons including the Soviet period and modern times, we are not catching up with anyone, but on the contrary, other leading states have yet to create the weapons that Russia already possess. This was a response maybe to the 2018 nuclear poster review of the United States. He said, that is not, he said that we must keep moving forward, carefully observing and analyzing the developments in the area across the world and create next generation combat systems and Americans assisted on Chinese participation in trilateral negotiation with Russia about future of nuclear arms control agreement in April 2020. But the Beijing rejected that assistance or demand of the trilateral arms control negotiations. So what we find it here in our region, in the case of South Asia, the America's BMD policy has encouraged and also facilitated India to develop its missile shield. The missile shield unleashes, unleashes a devastating new road of arms race between, between among the strategic competitors in the region and in that context we would find that India is not only adding MERS but advanced cruise missiles and these kind of things also in their arsenal. So with this, when we look about the Pakistan, Pakistan's stance on the Fissile Nuclear Treaty remains the same, which it has started from the very beginning. The most revealing is that why I'm saying the same, despite this, that there is a international criticism on Pakistan states, what they say. They say in order for negotiation to begin on the FNCT, Pakistan will have to remove its opposition, vote, and a consensus to move forward with the negotiation must be agreed. Pakistan, the representative or ambassador, made on May 20, 2021, against retreated. He said, Pakistan has not opposed the treaty on fissile material per se, rather, we are against a treaty that only results in a cutoff in the future production of fissile materials only. Pakistan's consistent position on fissile material treaty or FMT is well known and remains unchanged. So let me, before concluding, what is my understanding about this entire debate is that we have to not forget that the current trend, though scholars or analysts have been now assigning too much importance to this Geneva summit between the Putin and the President Biden, President Putin and President Biden, which had on June 16, I agree, both presidents reiterated their commitment to the nuclear taboo, reinvigoration of nuclear arms control, and risk reduction measures. But the tangible outcome is still awaiting. In a such a situation in South Asia, we cannot ignore what the modernization of the weapons have been taking place. So what is my final conclusion is that Pakistan's nuclear state proposal, arms control troughs with India, which it has been attempting again and again, are unsuccessful and unlikely to 
remain unsuccessful in future. India is not prepared for negotiating constraints on its nuclear forces and it is unlikely to start in, unlikely to start in the near future. To counter these challenges, Pakistan will need to strengthen its nuclear arsenal. It should continue manufacturing nuclear facility material to modernize its nuclear weapons. This is a requirement, this is the need of the time, and we forget about this, what the international community is trying to engage us, saying, facile material out of people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jaspal, for sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, I think some of the perspectives covered were very interesting, like various uh, reports falsely accused Pakistan of having the fastest growing nuclear program. In fact, these allegations are politically motivated and intended to keep the focus away from India's rapid growth in nuclear weapons and fissile material stocks. Uh, after some, some of these useful discussions, I would now request Dr. Rabia Akhtar to present her remarks as the reviewer of the book. Dr. Zafar Ibal Shima, my colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen. You've been a very patient audience, so I will be very brief. If you are looking for some fireworks from a reviewer, I will not be able to deliver because I agree with almost all the chapters that are part of this work. Uh, but let me state that uh, you know this volume edited by Dr. Zafar Ibal Shima with its 14 chapters is uh, a contribution of its kind by Pakistani scholars examining in detail the nuclear non-proliferation regime and its fault lines and challenges. I would like to congratulate each and every single author by name, uh, the editor, Dr. Zafar Ibal Shima, contributing authors, Dr. Zafar Khan, Dr. Ghulam Mujaddid, Dr. Ambassador Zamir Akram, Mr. Shamsu Zama, uh, Ms. Ayusha Khan, Dr. Tughal Yameen, Ms. Asma Khalid, Ambassador Tarek Usman Heather, Dr. Rizwan Basi, Ms. Pina Shiltaf, Dr. Zafar Nawaz Raspal, Ambassador Ali Sabah Nakwi, and Mr. Adnan Bukhari for their scholarly analysis on problems and prospects of the nuclear non-proliferation regime. So let us give them a huge round of applause. It is also a very proud moment for me because two of the authors in this book, uh, Ms. Binish and uh, Asma, are my former students. So it, when I was reading your chapters, it, I really felt proud. So thank you so much for your contribution. At the, you know, when Dr. Chima was presenting his remarks, he uh, started by providing five reasons as to why this edited volume presented by Pakistani scholars is important. Firstly, like everybody before me has made a comment that this scholarly research of Pakistani perspectives on the nuclear non-proliferation regime and its challenges, you know, adds to the research. Um, every time we travel or we uh, engage with international audience, uh, one thing, that we see is that you know people in DC have their jobs because of nuclear salvation. And they seem to be more worried about our region than we appear to be. And when we converse with them and when we talk to them, they um, you know say that you guys, we have to do your job because you're not doing it for yourself. How do we know that you are worried about the same things that we are worried about and write about? Crisis, war, escalation control, you know, there are a number of posts of issues that they write on. Um, so I think there is only one thing that we as Pakistani scholars, strategic community, academia can do is to write and write prolifically. So, so this uh, contribution is absolutely essential uh, voice of Pakistani scholars. Secondly, Dr. Shima, you know, mentioned that Pakistan's own evolution as a nuclear weapon state and its adherence to the international nuclear non-proliferation norms and treaties as part of the broader non-proliferation regime 
is a story which has not been documented uh, before this book. So this book fills that space as well. Thirdly, he mentions that India's exploitation and strategic cultivation of the landscape post 9-11 and global war on terrorism allowed India uh, to get the recognition and relief from the P5 leading to the Indo-US nuclear deal and to present its case for the NSG. Pakistan lacked the same approach. It was bogged down by the politics of the global war on terrorism, losing focus on Pakistan's national interests with respect to craving out, carving out its own space in the broader non-proliferation regime. So I think that's an essential aspect as to why this volume needed to come now. Fourthly, this book is important in this respect that it provides a reassessment of the non-proliferation regime itself, its own relevance to the arms control and non-proliferation dialogue, an inevitable collapse of the Cold War arms control structures that we all are witnessing today. Lastly, this book provides a thematically coherent compendium of Pakistani perspectives, which was long overdue compilation, but we finally have it. So by no means this book is exhaustive, so, and I'll talk a bit more about it later. As you will read this book, you should buy this book, and you should read this book. I would appreciate if you could take some time out to absorb the fact that Pakistan has been risen as nuclear weapon state, and not as the international community would like to call us, nuclear possessor state or a nuclear armed state. Pakistan did not sign the NPT, it stayed outside the club. But it is important that we as Pakistani strategic community, the experts, the scholars, the academics alike, we all reinforce our narrative. And that would begin by calling ourselves nuclear weapon states and not a nuclear armed state, because words matter and titles matter too. Having read this book several times over as its copy editor, I cannot say that I have a favorite chapter. All of the authors are my friends and colleagues, and I would like to like them to remain my friends and colleagues when I stop speaking here. So I must congratulate each and every one of them for their objective assessments of the topics that they've explored in this book. I'll just briefly take you through what each of them have written. Dr. Zafar Khan's exploration of the rationale for the creation of the nuclear non-proliferation regime is at the heart of this book scoping the landscape and setting the stage for other authors to build on that ground. Dr. Kulam Mujaldi's analysis on nuclear terrorism and the challenges of nuclear safety and security apprises us about the inadequacies of the NPT and the politics that surrounds nuclear security, hyping the threats of nuclear terrorism, and he made an excellent presentation on it today as well. Ambassador Zamir Atam takes us through the history of the NSG and discusses at length the approaches of exceptionalism and discrimination within the NSG and in that specifically discusses how India's prospective membership, if granted, will disturb the already fragile strategic stability in South Asia. Very important contribution. Mr. Shamsul Zaman Xmi examines in detail the Article 3 of the NPT the politics of transfer of technology from nuclear weapon states to non-nuclear weapon states, and how the geopolitics shapes selective sharing of technology, reinforcing security dilemmas in our regions. I think it's an important aspect because when we look at Article 3, we just look at technology transfer and we forget as to how the geopolitics of it shapes it. Ayusha Khan discusses Article 4 of the NPT, examining the rights of non-nuclear weapon states to assess nuclear technology for peaceful purposes and how the nuclear weapon states maintain their monopoly on nuclear technology, a saga of never-ending exploitation of the nuclear weapon states. Dr. Tobal Yami, he takes us through the Article 6 of the NPT and the disarmament commitment enshrined therein and it brings to light the language used in Article 6, uh, Article 4, Article 6, there, whereby nuclear weapon states are only required to negotiate disarmament in good faith, but it does not bind them or obligate them to disarm. Asma Khalid's chapter analyzes Article 10.1 of the NPT, giving rights to non-nuclear weapon states to withdraw from the treaty, a discussion on North Korea exercising its rights and possible withdrawal of Iran if its national security is threatened is an important contribution in this book. 
Ambassador Tarek Usman had his chapter on NPT RefCon 2015 examines the fissures within the community leading to their failure to reach a consensus in the previous RefCons and also in the upcoming RefCon. Citing Article 6 as the bone of contention, Ambassador Tariq Usman Heather predicts that increasing sense of insecurity in the non-nuclear weapon states may uh, compel more signatories to withdraw a treaty. We might see that in coming years. Dr. Rizwan Abbasi examines the global politics of nuclear energy in her chapter and she enlightens us about denial of nuclear technology to Pakistan for its legitimate energy needs, whereas accommodating India with the same non-NPT nuclear weapon status, based on which she suggests amendments to the non-proliferation regime to allow more countries, non-allies of the P5, to benefit from the NSG. Ms. Bina Shaltav uh, explores the dynamics of the CTBD and provides us Pakistan's and Indian perspectives on CTBD along with the discussion on the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Dr. Zafar Nawaz Aspal in his chapter and also in his presentation has talked about FMCD and has examined Pakistan's opposition to the FMCD, its position on FMCD and details the rationale behind it exploring India's current and future stockpiles of fissile materials since its fissile material production facilities are outside the IAEA safeguards and producing weapons grade fissile materials and fuel fabrications for its nuclear submarines, a, a great addition to this work. Ambassador Ali Silvanakwi's chapter examines the nuclear security summits of 2010, 12, 14 and 16 and he examines Pakistan's contribution to the nuclear security summit process and its willingness to continue to be a part of the process in the years to come. The last chapter in this book is by Mr. Nan Bukhari and he examines the dilemma of positive and negative security assurances, explores country positions of US, China, France, Russia, UK, India and Pakistan, Israel and North Korea and their understanding of assurances and the policies of nuclear use and important contribution. If you are interested in nuclear politics or politics of non-proliferation, this book with all its chapters should be a part of your collection. The NPT RefCon, and Dr. Chima mentioned it, has been postponed to August 2, 2021 and possibly later due to this pandemic. There is a level of uncertainty and risks around nuclear weapons and it reminds us of the early Cold War years and the anxieties therein. There is a visible tension between nuclear weapon states that continues to rise as we witness the multipolar nuclear order take shape. In addition to trust issues, there is lack of transparency and dialogue. The fate of the arms control framework is uncertain. The role of nuclear weapons is expanding and nuclear weapon states are engaged in a qualitative nuclear arms race. What complicates this scenario further is the nexus between emerging technologies and nuclear weapons exposing us all to the vulnerabilities and the risks. And this has further blurred the lines between the conventional and strategic capabilities. Um, Honorable Chair, Vice Chancellor Air University, Air Marshal Javed Ahmed Sir, you, Vice Chancellor Air University, Air Marshal Javed Ahmed Sir, you thank you for mentioning uh, the MOU that we will, uh, University of Lahore, will be signing with the Air University. And I would like to take this opportunity to apprise the audience that you know, taking inspiration from Dr. Zafar Iqbal Chima's work, probably our institutions uh, can explore a second volume of this book uh, whereby we look at um, the proliferation trends of these emerging technologies with their nexus with nuclear weapons and as to how and why uh, you will see the P5 and those in power will not agree on an arms control framework to stop the proliferation of hypersonics and as to how um, you know this will continue, this trend will continue until a strategic parity is uh, achieved between the superpowers, the likes of which we saw during the Cold War. Um, with this, I would like to uh, tell you that as we approach the uncertain world, let me remove myself from one uncertainty and assure that lunch awaits you. Uh, 
before our last week this week. So thank you so much. Uh, please buy the book. It's an excellent contribution. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shima, for giving me an opportunity to be the copy editor of this book. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, sir, or chair, for sharing your remarks during this session. And I, I also like to extend my thanks to the speakers and reviewer for presenting an all encompassing view on the subject matter. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for your patience. But before ending the proceedings of the session, I would like Dr. Zafar Iqbal, Chima, President, Executive Director, SPI, to give a vote of thanks. Sir, please come to the roster. I'm very personally thankful to the chief guest who has to leave because of his engagement elsewhere. I'm very grateful to the panelists uh, who have taken time out of their busy schedule to be here with us and share their opinions about the book. And particularly, I'm more thankful to Air Chief Air Marshal Javed Ahmed, the Vice Chancellor of the Air University, for finding time and also making the facilities available. It is not just this all, but the entire university is almost our disposal. So I'm very grateful for your kindness, sir, for allowing us to hold this function here. I am also grateful to all of you, and since you have come to in a very hot weather and uh, COVID environment, I, I announce with clear that each of you is entitled to a free copy of the book. So that's, that's the reason you take, out, take a free copy, and those who have already paid it, they are they're entitled to a refund of that. Uh, I think that you shall say, uh, wants to hold certain souvenirs, learning ceremony, before we allow it. Uh, you are all invited to down, uh, uh, sorry, a lunch downstairs and then in one of the lounge of the hall. So please take a lunch with us. So over to you. Sir, I would like you to re I, I would like to request you to give up uh, to present a copy of our to the chairs and our panelists. First of all, I would like to request you to present a copy of the book to our Asian Marshal Jali and Hilali and Tiaz Military Sir.
Thank you so very much for our panelists. I would like you to mention that some of the authors could not join us today and some have to left early. But this is a I request, so therefore I request Dr. Zafar Iqbal Jinnah to kindly present a few of the authors who are here with us to present a copy of the book. I will, recall, I will call your name please when your name is called come to the stage. I request from Mr. Shamsu Zaman sir please come to the stage. Ms. Dinesh Altaf, please come to the stage now. Now here I would like to thank our panelists one again, once again, all of our authors for joining us today. Now it is requested that chairs, speakers, reviewers, authors. And the SVI is team to assemble in front of the stage for a group photo. Thank you so much. All the authors, reviewers, panelists. Please come to the stage. SVIT also. Sir, Farid Binuri, please, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank all the audience for joining us today. Guests are requested to proceed for the lunch, which is served outside at the front lawn. It is requested from all the guests to follow the COVID-related SOPs during the lunch as well. Please patiently wait for your turn at the buffet station during the meal while maintaining the six feet distance in the queue. Thank you all. Thank you so much for joining us today.